Good day everyone! How is your day going so far? By the way, I am Shilami Diator. In continuation of Ms. Aspasio's report about the stages of communication, she already tackled the source or sender message encoding and channel so at this moment i'm going to discuss the remaining four stages of communication such as receiver decoding feedback and noise so what is receiver receiver is the person or a group of persons to whom the message is conveyed in case of telephonic conversation the sender can send message to one receiver but in case of group discussions seminars and conferences receivers can be more than one the message must be designed encoded and transmitted in a manner that receiver can understand easily use of technical words jargons and complicated symbols should be avoided depending on the channel selected receiver may be a listener viewer or a reader so after a receiver the decoding will exist so what is decoding Decoding means giving meaningful interpretation to the message. On receiving the message, the receiver translates the symbols into meaningful information to the best of his ability. Communication is effective if receiver understands the message in the same way as intended by the sender. The receiver must, therefore, be familiar with the codes and symbols used by the sender in his message. And the seventh one is noise. So what is noise? Why does noise occur in the stages of communication? So noise, it represents the disturbing factor in the process of communication. It interferes with effective communication and reduces clarity of the message. The message may be interpreted differently than intended by the sender. Conversing near a machine making sounds, disturbance in the telephone line, Physical ailment or mental distress of sender or receiver are the common causes of noise that obstruct the quality of message transmitted from sender to the receiver. So after the, the noise, then the feedback will occur. So speaking of feedback, it is the receiver's response to the sender's message. The receiver communicates reaction to the sender through words, symbols, or gestures. It is the reversal of communication process where receiver becomes the sender and sender becomes the receiver. Unless the receiver responds to the message, communication process is incomplete. Feedback helps the sender transform his message if needed. It also allows the receiver to clear doubts in the message, ask questions to build his confidence and enables the sender to know efficiency of the message. Feedback of information makes the communication process complete. So to sum it up, there are eight stages of communication. Those are source or sender, message, encoding, channel, receiver, decoding, feedback, and noise. Thus, through the stages of communication, the sharing of a common meaning between the sender and receiver takes place. Individuals that follow the communication process will have the opportunity to become more productive in every aspect of their profession. Thus, effective communication leads to understanding. The next topic is levels of communication. So, based on your stock knowledge, what are the levels of communication? Yes, everything, everyone is correct. So, in our daily life, communication enables us to connect with people, share our experiences and needs, and strengthen our bonds. It gives us the chance to communicate our views, share information and expressions and emotions. All of us must communicate. The first level of communication is interpersonal communication. I know that this term is very familiar to you, so what does it mean? Intrapersonal communication means the communication you have with yourself. 
You may be surprised to learn that thinking, writing notes to remind yourself of things you need to do, and talking your, to yourself are all forms of interpersonal communication. In this level of communication, you are both persons sending and receiving the message because you play this dual role. The chances of misinterpretation or miscommunication are easily non-existent. So it means that you communicate with oneself. You send the message to yourself and you yourself receive that message. So have you ever repeated a song that you just heard while looking in the mirror? Or talked to yourself in the mirror? They dream, wrote a diary or private blog. Memorize out loud notes or a dialogue in a play, or even said, I can do it before taking a test or having a report. And that is example of interpersonal communication. In addition to it, the history of interpersonal communication was coined in the 1960s by American psychologist Carl Rogers. He used it to refer to modes of self-expression through which people mediate their inner worlds. Rogers defined interpersonal communication as the flow of meaning within an individual toward or away from the self. He also described it as a means by which we communicate with ourselves to explore our thoughts, feelings, and attitudes. Secondly, interpersonal communication. So what does it mean? It is the process of exchange of information, ideas, and feelings between two or more people through verbal or non-verbal methods. So it means that it often includes face-to-face -face exchange of information in a form of voice, facial expressions, body language, and gestures. The level of one's interpersonal communication skills is measured through the effectiveness of transferring messages to others. So, it is a communication between people whose lines mutually influence one another and typically occurs in dyads, which means in pairs. And sometimes, interpersonal communication called dyadic communication, in which dyad means a unit made up of two parts. So, for example, talking with another individual, exchanging text messages or emails, Video conferencing of a non-verbal like a shrug of the shoulders or a meaningful glance are all, are all examples of interpersonal communication. In order for interpersonal communication to be considered successful, the person receiving the messages has to receive the comprehend the message that the sender intended to send. The third one is group discussion. So what does it mean? It means that the act of sending and receiving messages to multiple members of a group. For example, in a business environment, groups often use this type of communication to exchange ideas, determine goals, and motivate other members. So the size of groups can vary, but they typically comprise at least 3 members and up to 20 members. Group communication can be beneficial for groups of all sizes, from smaller focus groups to entire departments. When groups communicate effectively, they can share necessary information as they work to accomplish mutual goals. In the other term, more, it means that more than two people communicate each other in the same group. Group communication is important because it is through messages that groups make decisions, manage conflict, and build the rapport that is necessary to keep the group going in difficult circumstances. The extents of messages sharper what the group will be and what the group can accomplish. There are two classifications of group discussion, namely small group communication and large group communication. So when we say small group communication, it refers to interactions among three to nine people who are connected through a common purpose, mutual influence, and a shared identity. For example, in a, in a classroom, who has a brainstorming ideas? Individuals who interact verbally and non-verbally 
occupy certain roles with respect to one another and cooperate to accomplish a goal, it is according to Gamble. A small number of people with complementary skills who are committed to a common purpose, performance goals, and a common approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. While the large group communication, it is a communication context describing a large number of individuals in a group. It is also known as public address. It is a communication situation consisting of a speaker who addresses a large crowd in a formal tone and manner on a subject matter which is of general interest of the audience. For example, having con concerts, lectures. Large communication does still allow for feedback between the audience and the communicators. The fourth one is public communication. So the purpose of public communication is to deliver a message, news, or a piece of information that people or audience could learn from. Public communication is used to inform and persuade, build relationships from connections and create a network. So public communication helps us stay in touch with everything that happens around us. It is important to be open to communicate and share information. Newspaper, editorials, and bill advertisements are other forms of public communication. Mass media like newspapers, magazines, radio, TV are a powerful tool for public communication. Some examples of public communication happen through public speaking events, conferences, seminars, and press conference. So, public communication can be defined as a strategic communication to convey ideas, programs through presentations, data propaganda to the masses, the public, and the students. So, there are three types of public communication. The first one is speaking to inform. For example, informative and argumentative speech. Speaking to persuade, motivate, or take action. For example, persuasive speech, argumentative, controversial, or policy speeches. And lastly, speaking to entertain, which is funny and special occasion speeches. The last level of communication is what we call mass communication. So what does it mean? It means that the electronic or print transmission of messages to the general public. It occurs when messages are sent to large audiences using print or electronic media, any type of media that is used to communicate with mass audiences. Communication which involves the mass media like public communication, the audience is also heterogeneous. Example, it is sent through radio, television, film, newspapers, and the internet. To sum it up, there are five levels of communication. Those are interpersonal communication, interpersonal communication, group communication that consists of two, small, small communication and large group communication, public communication, and lastly, mass communication. And now, we're going to proceed to the next topic, which is all about basic tenets or maxims of communication. So what are those maxims of communication? What are their essence in having a communication or in communicating with others? But before that, we're going to use the Grice maxims of conversation or sometimes known as Grice maxims of communication. The Grice maxims of conversation are maxims of quantity or be informative, maxims of quality or be truthful, maxims of relation be relevant and maxims of manner or be clear when you write or talk you generally do so with the purpose of conveying information and the better you are at conveying information the more likely people are to understand and accept what you have to say however despite the importance of being able to communicate effectively and despite the frequency in which we attempt to do so we often make mistakes when we try to convey information to others, right? Some of these mistakes are relatively minor and only make our communication slightly less effective than it could be, while other mistakes are relatively major and lead to serious misunderstandings. Fortunately, 
there are some simple principles which is known as Grice maxims of conversation that we can use that will help us to avoid these mistakes in communication. So simply put, Grice maxims of conversation are a collection of maxims proposed by linguist Paul Grice to describe principles that people intuitively follow in order to guide their conversations in order to make their communicative efforts effective. The first maxims of conversation is maxims of quantity or be informative. There are two maxims of quantity. The first one is make your contribution as informative as is required. Means provide all the information which is necessary for the purpose of the current exchange. Don't leave out anything important. Secondly, do not make your contribution more informative that is required. Means leave out any unnecessary details that aren't important to the current exchange. The second maxims of conversation is maxims of quality or be truthful. So there is one super maxim of quality. Try to make your contribution one that is true. Furthermore, based on the super maxim, there are two more specific maxims of quality or referred to as sub maxims the first one is do not say what you believe to be false it means that avoid stating information that you believe might be wrong unless there is some valid reasons if you do to choose include it then provide a disclaimer that points your doubts regarding this information and the second one is do not say that for which you will lack evidence. It means that avoid including information that you can't back up with supporting evidence. If you do choose to include such information, then provide a disclaimer that points out your doubts. The remaining two maxims of conversation such as maxims of relation or be relevant, maxims of manner or be clear will discuss by Butch Aurelius. That ends my report. Thank you and God bless everyone.